Now we're going to go to the backlash against the Golden Globes after they failed to nominate a single woman for Best Director or Best Screenplay, despite a crowded field of potential nominees. And in a year where women appear to be missing in a lot of the key categories, including that of Best Director. How do you feel, though, about, I mean, I, I feel like it's happening again this awards season. We're having this conversation, not enough female directors yeah. being recognized. Every few years, the media embarks on the Sisyphusian task of wondering just why it is that no women appear in the Best Director category at various awards shows. Of course, awards recognition isn't a be-all, end-all metric of achievement, but the repeated lack of nominations is an obvious symptom that can help us diagnose a much larger problem. In its latest study, the USC Annenberg Inclusion Initiative identified that of the 112 directors behind the 100 top grossing movies of 2018, only 3.6% were women. This imbalance isn't a modern phenomenon. For decades, female directors have seemed too few and far between, their work rendered invisible by an established canon with a rigid definition of prestige. Who are the incredible filmmakers that historians and critics have tended to overlook? And what have we lost by excluding their work? Turner Classic Movies series Women Make Film, A New Road Movie Through Cinema sets out to answer those questions. Described as a guided tour of the art and craft of the movies, this 14-part documentary uses almost a thousand film extracts from 13 decades and five continents. Its director, Mark Cousins, explores how movies depict life, love, politics, humor, and death, all through the compelling lens of some of the world's greatest directors, all of them women. Watching the series has been eye-opening. It's exposed me to films and filmmakers I'd never heard of, while detailing the techniques that make their work special, frame by frame. It's valuable to analyze the work of female directors at face value. It clearly hasn't been done enough. But it's also important to understand why they were left out of the conversation in the first place. Historically, how have stereotypes and other unwritten social rules affected the reception of their films? How about the filmmaking process in general? What strategic calculations have women had to make that their male counterparts did not? Now here on Be Kind Rewind, we like to talk about actresses. And conveniently for us, many actresses in Hollywood history have become directors. Regina King's debut, One Night in Miami, has received glowing praise so far this year. Olivia Wilde just earned critical acclaim for Booksmart last year. Netflix just acquired Halle Berry's debut, Bruised. It's really common now, but truthfully, acting has always been one of the most reliable pipelines for women to direct in America. Mabel Normand, Elaine May, Barbara Loden, Lee Grant, Anne Bancroft, Joan Rivers, Angelina Jolie, Jodie Foster, Elizabeth Banks, and many, many more. And there are plenty of international examples too, like Margarita Von Trotta and Diane Curie. Why? Well, as actress turned director Ida Lupino once put it, for women, directing is almost impossible to do unless you're an actress or a writer with power. Power. Box office appeal, access to financing, connection to other artists and filmmakers, experience marketing a film, fluency in industry jargon. It all helps. So in this video, I'd like to tell the stories of two actresses who did just that, Ida Lupino and Barbara Streisand. I'll explore how they became directors, as well as the gendered experiences that affected both their leadership styles on set and the ways in which their work was received. Of course, their journeys do not represent the broad scope of experiences women directors have faced. For example, the uphill climb for women of color is much, much steeper. But I hope that their stories can help illuminate the history of gender dynamics at work for directors and aid in the process of reframing our history around more than one kind of groundbreaking artist. But then it's a whole nother world in the back of the camera, isn't it? Yes, a whole nother world, a very good world, girl. Ida Lupino was born to be a movie star. The daughter of a famous British theatrical family, she made her film debut at age 14. At 15, she immigrated to the United States to audition for Paramount's Alice in Wonderland. Well, apparently, Ralph, I had a terribly deep voice ever since I was a little girl. And uh, they heard this voice and they said, you couldn't possibly be 
Alice, you sound like Mae West. Oh. Do not get thrown. <laughs> Alice wasn't in the cards, but that voice, coupled with her ability to channel intense emotions, eventually led her toward a villainous breakout performance in The Light That Failed, which caught the attention of Warner Brothers. And it's not hard to see what they had in mind. Picture. Picture. What do I care about your picture? I hate you, do you understand? I hate you. I never cared for you, not once. I was always making a fool of you. You bored me stiff. I hated you. Betty Davis was queen of the Warner lot, so the theory was that any films she rejected or roles that were perhaps too small for her could trickle down to Ida. I was the poor man's Betty Davis, she once joked, selling herself a bit short. Her best roles at Warner Brothers tended toward the femme fatale. She was tough, smart, and cynical, though never totally invulnerable. Her characters had to climb to the top and never had an easy time reaching it, if they ever reached it at all. But like Betty, the limitations of the studio system frustrated Ida. She felt unfulfilled and rejected her fair share of roles too. She wanted to expand herself and explore a different kind of filmmaking altogether. I really want to create stories, personalities, pictures, she told one journalist. Sooner or later, I should like to remain behind the camera instead of in front of the camera. So rather than renew her contract with Warner Brothers, she went freelance and started a production company with her then husband, Collier Young, called The Filmmakers, with one M. The Filmmakers sought to produce realistic, issue-oriented films as an alternative to the glamour and melodrama sold to audiences by the major studios. In their quest for authenticity, they utilized real locations rather than sound stages, and purposely avoided hiring big name actors to star in their films. They adopted the mantra, it's not who's in a picture, but what's in a picture. For the filmmakers, the what meant tackling taboo topics like rape and polio, things that major studios tended to ignore in an effort to appeal to the broadest possible audience and to appease censors. The company's first film, Not Wanted, about an out-of-wedlock pregnancy, inadvertently morphed Ida into a director. Several days into production, its director, Elmer Clifton, had a heart attack and couldn't finish filming. Ida, who both produced the film and co-wrote the screenplay, had no choice but to step in and direct. No one else knew the material as well as she did, and frankly, with such a small budget, they couldn't afford to hire anybody else, especially at the last minute. Although she claimed she never intended to become a director, one has to suspect that the ambition had been brewing, given that during her suspensions at Warner Brothers, she spent all of her time on the sets of other films, learning from some of the finest cameramen, editors, and directors. Ida completed the film for Clifton and, of course, didn't get official credit. Not Wanted cost just $150,000 to make, a paltry sum even for 1949, and the film easily earned it back within the first two weeks of its release date. Ida was urged to direct more films under the filmmaker's banner, and so her second career began, a career which gave us the surreal point of view of a woman in labor and not wanted, the harrowing bird's eye view of a young woman escaping her attacker in outrage, and the shadowy claustrophobia in the classic film noir, The Hitchhiker. As Martin Scorsese once wrote, what is at stake in Lupino's films is the psyche of the victim. They addressed the wounded soul and traced the slow, painful process of women trying to wrestle with despair and reclaim their lives. Her work is resilient, with a remarkable empathy for the fragile and the heartbroken. It is essential. Ida was by no means the first female director in Hollywood, but when she joined the Directors Guild in 1950, its second female member after Dorothy Arzner, she was the only female on a roster of 1,300 members, and the only female director working, period. Her gender made her an anomaly, and her celebrity heightened her visibility to industry insiders and the press. Ida was largely treated as more of a curiosity than something shocking or improper that would prompt an industry-wide backlash. She was even invited to present Best Director at the 1950 Oscars. If a genie ever gave me a wish, I think I'd know how I'd like to spend it. I want my name to be in a list like this. Those nominated for the best achievement in directing are... To be sure, part of this is because the studios knew that Ida, cobbling together low-budget films by herself, was not an institutional threat. She had neither the means nor the intention to become their competition. And while she advocated for more women directors than in interviews and nearly succeeded in recruiting Claudette Colbert to join her ranks, she did not represent a social movement that would ideologically challenge status quo hiring practices. 
Plus, Ida was still useful to major studios as an actress, starring in films like On Dangerous Ground and The Big Knife. As willing as the studios were to let Ida do her thing, not everyone welcomed her with open arms. When it was announced that the actress would turn director, the announcement was met in some quarters with disbelief. One newspaper correspondent characterized the announcement that Ida Lupino wanted to direct as frivolous, as if directing were simply some useless, expensive venture to sate the whim of a spoiled actress. Even in day-to-day -day interactions, Ida couldn't help but notice how her experiences differed from those of her peers. For instance, here's Joe Mankiewicz accepting that Oscar. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Lupino. Ms. Lupino's name, incidentally, on the membership list of the Screen Directors Guild is Irving Lupino. Ida's interviews demonstrate that she clearly spent time strategizing how she should negotiate her gender in a space typically reserved for men. In 1972, Ida told The Hollywood Reporter, I've walked on sets and felt resentment from actors and crew members because I was a woman. While I've encountered some resentment from the male species for intruding into their world, I give them no opportunity to think I've strayed or I don't belong. As if anticipating criticisms for overstepping her bounds as a woman, she leaned into the performance of femininity by emphasizing her beliefs that directing didn't call for touches like mannish clothes. Quite the reverse, in fact. She took pains to make sure her attire, makeup, and general appearance were strictly feminine. When asked how it felt to be Hollywood's only female director, she said, fine. But she had advice for others of her sex who want to direct films. Keep your powder dry and your puff handy. It wasn't so difficult to invade a man's field if you pay them the compliment of remaining feminine, she said. I dress as carefully when I'm directing a picture as if I'm starring in it. The crew and the cameramen appreciate this. The press loved this topic as well, both to distinguish her as the only woman and almost to reassure readers that nothing too different was going on. For though she spends her life in a man's calling, she is unstintingly feminine in manner. To command all male crews who more than likely had never worked for a woman before, Ida adopted a non-threatening maternal persona on set and embraced the nickname Mother, which she emblazoned on the back of her director's chair. As Grisham and Grossman wrote in their book on Ida Lupino, Mother gave her the means to take control of the set without alienating her co-workers. Gradually, the nickname became more performative and a way to diffuse anxiety more than anything else. Explaining her tactics, she once said, You don't tell a man, you suggest to him. Darlings, Mother has a problem. I'd love to do this. Can you do it? It sounds kooky, I know, but can you do it for mother? And then they do it. And that way I get more cooperation. Now, from what I've read, she never explicitly expressed regret or frustration that she basically had to pander through a persona. This kind of double talk worked on the censorship office too. But in retrospect, it's kind of a shame she ever had to. At the same time, these tongue in cheek comments are rather cunning. Her kind of blunt insight demonstrates how deeply she understood the gender dynamics at play and the extent to which she adapted to wield them in her favor. And by and large, it seemed to work. Report after report stated that the lady boss fostered a tone of congeniality and that Ida was a smart, tough director to work for. Ida, Ida, I didn't lose, Ida didn't lose battles. She not only won the battle, she won the war. And everybody liked her, the whole crew, everybody was... She wanted something, by God, they did it for. The business side of the filmmakers flopped for, uh, reasons, causing Ida to turn toward television to sustain her directing career. Tonight's Screen Directors Playhouse proudly presents Miss Ida Lupino, renowned for her direction of The Hitchhiker and The Bigamist. She became a prolific television director, working on episodes of some of the most famous shows of the 50s and 60s, including Gilligan's Island, Bewitched, and The Twilight Zone. In 1966, she directed her last feature film, The Trouble with Angels for Columbia. No other woman directed a film for a major studio until 1971, when Elaine May directed A New Leaf for Paramount. The emergence of the women's movement and increased representation in studio leadership helped create more and more opportunities for female directors. Uncoincidentally, it's also around this time you start to see articles directly address this inequality and obviously blame women for it. 
Males have never shown any particular resentment at taking orders on the set from one of the opposite sex. Not so with lady thesps. They resent one of their own kind telling them how to act. They're inclined to pout, break into tears, and storm the front office pouring out their alleged woes. According to Maya Montaigne's Smulkers Liberating Hollywood, just 16 women made feature films within the US-based film industry, either as part of the studio system or as independent filmmakers between 1967 and 1980. The early 80s saw even more progress. Five films directed by women came out in 1980 alone. Three of the five were directed by actresses. Catherine Bigelow made The Loveless in 1981, Amy Heckerling directed Fast Times at Ridgemont High in 1982, while Susan Seidelman directed Smithereens. But it wasn't until a film directed by another actress, a superstar really, that a female-directed film would dominate the awards narrative for the first time. I want to be able to grow, to stretch, to, to be all that I can be. And I don't like to be told that that's impossible. In 1975, critic Molly Haskell described the magnitude of Barbara Streisand's stardom for the New York Times. It is to belabor the obvious to say that the movie stars of the last decade have been men. In fact, the list of top box office draws published annually by Variety would have been exclusively male, but for one familiar female intruder, the kook from Brooklyn who altered her name but not her nose, the girl who belted and bullied her way onto the list and contrived to stay there. For seven years, Streisand has been the only woman in movies who, in the language of mega corporate money talk, was bankable. One would think that a star of such significance could easily usher a personal project to the silver screen, and in some cases that might be true. It was not the case for Barbara Streisand and Yentl. Barbara first read the story Yentl, the Yeshiva Boy by Isaac Bashevis Singer in 1968, just after her Academy Award-winning debut in Funny Girl. The story follows a young woman named Yentl who disguises herself as a boy named Anshul so she can pursue formal religious training, a path unavailable to women. And I called up my agent and I said, I just found my next movie. And I said, Yentl, the yeshiva, where they went, oh no. <laughs> you know? Her agents warned her against playing two explicitly Jewish characters in a row, but she bought the rights to the story anyway, intending to produce it in the future. Two years later, First Artists, a production company she formed with some fellow actors, announced that Yentl, then called Masquerade, would be directed by Ivan Passer, with a screenplay from Passer and Isaac Singer. Or, as the New York Times reported it, if you thought Barbara Streisand was the greatest star by far in Funny Girl, wait till you see her as Funny Boy. She wasn't happy with Passer and Singer's drafts, and the project was dropped. After her mm, contentious experience on A Star is Born, Barbara decided that she needed to helm this project as its director. The story was very personal, a way for her to connect with her father who'd passed away when she was just one year old, and a pathway to learning more about her own faith as a Jewish woman. She kept pushing, but none of the major studios were interested. The same companies that earned hundreds of millions of dollars from her films, like What's Up Doc and The Way We Were, could not fathom a world in which American audiences would line up to buy tickets for an introspective, gender-bending love story that takes place in a yeshiva in turn-of-the-century Poland. No matter her star power, it wasn't worth the risk. Maybe they'd be interested if it was a musical. Given the number of hits she'd been charting, maybe. So in 1980, Orion announced that it would be producing Yentl, now a musical. But the November day Barbara submitted her budget, notorious flop Heaven's Gate opened in theaters and stayed there for about five minutes. The enormous amount of money lost by Heaven's Gate gave studios cold feet about anything that might cost over $10 million to make. Orion pulled out of the deal. The various reasons given by film industry sources were that Orion withdrew because of the film's ethnic theme, its large budget, the necessity of filming overseas, and the fact that Streisand was a novice director. Barbara was back at square one. Finally, United Artists pulled through. Though as Dale Pollock wrote for the LA Times, UA knew how badly she wanted to make this movie. It was a rare opportunity for a studio to turn the tables on a star. 
She said, I constantly had to give up everything. I didn't get paid for writing. I got paid Director's Guild scale for directing, which I think is something like $80,000. And I got paid much less as an actress than I did on my last film. Although this pay scale was interpreted as UA using her eagerness as leverage, the industry does have a habit of underpaying its female directors, especially when they take on more than one role in a film. For example, Paramount paid Elaine May just $50,000 to star in, write, and direct A New Leaf. Walter Matthau received $375,000 just to act. I'm poor. So 15 years after she read the short story, Yentl was underway. It's interesting that with her directorial debut, Barbara Streisand chose to tell a story involving a literal performance of gender the changes and sacrifices a woman must make to inhabit a role typically reserved for men, something she and Ida could both identify with. Though Barbara seemed much less concerned with embodying a certain kind of femininity than Ida was on set, the 80s provided a little more latitude in that area than the 50s, she too was conscious of the new dynamic created by her position of power. I never wanted people to feel that I was so powerful. I was a little embarrassed by it, which I feel was my, the feminine part of me that is still embarrassed by so much power. And so it made me feel even more feminine, even a bit shyer, a bit more soft-spoken than I, than I normally am. How a woman should or should not act became a central theme of the film's reception. It's true that Yentl resists easy categorization. To bring this project into the mainstream was also to challenge the normative ideas of what a prestige picture could look like. But it's also true that many of Yentl's most pervasive criticisms had nothing to do with the film itself, and more to do with Barbara's audacity to pursue the project in the first place. Reviews were largely positive, though seemingly willful misinterpretations of the film's structure, like why Barbara is the only one who sings, led to the belief that Yentl was simply a vanity project. Even Isaac Singer sounded off in the New York Times. No matter how good you are, you don't take everything for yourself. I don't mean to say that my script was perfect or even good, but at least I understood that in this case, the leading actress cannot monopolize the stage. We all know that actors fight for bigger parts, but a director worth his name will not allow one actor to usurp the entire play. When an actor is also the producer and the director and the writer, he would have to be exceedingly wise to curb his appetites. I must say that Miss Streisand was exceedingly kind to herself. This is, of course, funny coming from a man who framed his op-ed as an interview with himself. So as if this were the first time in history an author hadn't liked the film adaptation of their work, and as if Singer didn't practically admit his ego had taken a hit, his disapproval legitimized the idea that Yentl was nothing more than a vain quest for attention. Despite the ongoing criticism of Barbara's ambitions, and in spite of the unimaginative executives who'd assumed the film would be unprofitable, Yentl earned over $40 million at the box office, more than double its budget. Come award season, it won Best Comedy or Musical at the Golden Globes, and Barbara won Best Director, making her the first, and as of my publishing date, still the only woman to win this award. This award um, is very meaningful to me. I'm very proud because it also represents, um, I hope, new opportunities for so many talented women that February, despite heavy promotion in Hollywood trade papers, Yentl received just five Academy Award nominations. No nomination for Best Picture, Director, or even Actress. Journalist Greg Kilday wrote in the Washington Post, Hollywood, secretly thrilled by La Scandal Streisand, pretended to be stunned. The nominations were widely interpreted as a personal slap at Streisand, who had defied most of the power brokers in the movie business by insisting on writing, directing, producing, and acting in Yentl. The media scrambled to explain the snub. Articles focused on whether or not Streisand was a team player and took pains to point out that, well, Streisand had never been voted Miss Congeniality. People Magazine even published a numbered list of theories. Theory number one being, Hollywood hates her. Some of the theories even contradicted each other. Theory number two, 
Hollywood is jealous. But also, theory number seven, Yentl wasn't good enough. Theory number five even cited a ludicrous rumor that Streisand couldn't possibly have directed Yentl herself because it was Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, actually, because she had shared the rough cuts with them. So on the one hand, you have Barbara Streisand, who fought for 15 years to get a movie made, who left her name off of the screenplay when submitting it to studios because she was afraid if they saw her name on it, people in Hollywood wouldn't like it, who also hid her director's credit at the end of the film because she didn't want audiences to be prejudiced, and who sacrificed fair payment for her work. And on the other hand, you have Streisand, who is publicly derided as a control freak, whose ego is the size of an ocean, and who is just too aggressive about achieving her vision. It was never about a qualitative analysis of her work. It was an excuse to complain about her alleged personal shortcomings. In 1984, the double standards would have been obvious to anyone who cared enough to notice. Becoming a director after a successful acting career is overstepping your bounds, unless you're Robert Redford. Being a multi-hyphenate artist who crafts a deeply personal, unconventional film is vain, unless you're Warren Beatty writing, directing, producing, and acting in a three-hour epic about the communist revolution, in which case it is very admirable, and here is your best director Oscar, sir. Do you think it's because you're a woman? I mean, Stallone directs, acts, and writes in Rocky, and nobody thinks a thing about it. If a woman does the same kind of thing or is in a powerful position, she's considered pushy, aggressive, opinionated, um, and that there's a derogatory sense to the adjectives, which I find very unfair, very unjust. It's how she's handled herself, one Academy Award-winning producer told Kilday, as if depriving Barbara a nomination were a deterrent to discourage her future endeavors, he continued, I think she'll probably be a much easier person to work with from here on in. It should be noted that a backlash to the backlash occurred on Barbara's behalf. The board of the California chapter of the National Organization for Women passed a resolution declaring its dissatisfaction, fans protested at the red carpet of the Academy Awards, and female filmmakers rushed in to defend her. Fellow actor-director Lee Grant told People, you kept hearing at every lunch how she was spending too much, how she was an egomaniac, how it was all falling apart, and then of course when she came back, all of the stories were the exact opposite. What's important is that she keeps making films. She really kicked in the door for women on this one, not just opened it. Only one woman had been nominated for Best Director before Barbara Streisand uh, wasn't. Lena Wertmuller for Seven Beauties in 1977. No woman would win until Catherine Bigelow in 2010. And guess who got to present it to her? Well, the time has come. <laughs> Catherine Bigelow! It's not surprising to me that the work of female directors has gone under-examined. Though the two actresses I discussed in this video had substantial careers as directors, they were only encouraged to grow so far. After the filmmakers folded, major studios did not embrace Ida Lupino as a director. She was not offered opportunities the same way that similarly independent, issue-oriented producers like Stanley Kramer were. After Yentl, Barbara Streisand didn't direct another film for eight years. And her next film, The Prince of Tides, encountered familiar resistance. Although it scored seven total nominations, including Best Picture, Adapted Screenplay, Cinematography, Actor, and Supporting Actress, Barbara was not nominated for Best Director, which as Columbia Pictures chairman Mark Canton told the LA Times, is like saying you can hit a baseball without a bat. To draw a line from Yentl becoming Anshul, to Ida's wry motherhood on set, to the rejection of Barbara's ambition, is to trace a certain awareness women must have of their gender in order to navigate the world. What's disappointing to me is not that these things happened, but that they are still happening, that their challenges don't even scratch the surface of stories about women who couldn't utilize the privileges of race and power like they could. 
TCM and Mark Cousins are doing important work in reimagining the canon to include women who maybe haven't gotten Criterion editions or didn't make a killing at the box office or aren't constantly labeled important auteurs, but who contributed to the language and magic of cinema nevertheless. The future of studying film history will be so much richer if we continue to show that it is just as easy to reach great heights by standing on the shoulders of giantesses as it is giants. I know Barbara Streisand isn't exactly an obscure figure, but I hope I did my part in stirring up curiosity about the series, because I promise you, you will learn about someone you wish you'd heard of years ago. The channel will be showing Ida Lupino's Outrage on November 3rd at 9.15 p.m. and Yentl on November 17th at 9.15 a.m. If you have access to the channel, I encourage you to check out those and the incredible slate of films scheduled in this series through December. If you can't make those dates specifically, if you're, I don't know, doing something on November 3rd, TCM makes films available to stream on demand on their website for a few weeks after they air live. Also, as an aside, most of Ida Lupino's films have lapsed into the public domain, so I'll link those in the description as well. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked what you saw, please consider liking and subscribing. Now, go watch a good movie.